Hey, isn't it crazy how there are things we didn't even like before coronavirus, but now we would give anything to just experience them again? You know what I'm talking about? Like I was chatting with a friend about this, how we were like listing the things we never really appreciated, but now we would love to be in a position to experience them again. I'm, I'm talking about the things that like you overlooked in life, but you would love to have. Like the way that a floor is sticky at the bar because it's all grimy at the end of the day. Or like we talked about how I would love just to smell the men's gym locker room at my gym again because it would mean I actually get to go to the gym. Like for real, remember how good it felt to cancel plans? That feels great. I miss that. It's addicting. Or even just remember how good it was just not knowing who Carol Baskin was. That would have been great if we could just go back to that. If you've got an example of something you totally took for granted, but you'd love to experience right now, comment below wherever you're watching. We want to know from you, what are some of the things that maybe you took for granted, but you'd love to experience. But the truth is, even these crazy things we really didn't like before coronavirus, we'd love to experience now. We long for these moments because we've lost these moments. And we're grateful for them in a strange way because we can't experience them right now. Now, I know truthfully, none of us are feeling anxious or depressed because we've lost some of those things. Like no one is depressed about the fact they can't smell their gym locker room or overpay for a mediocre cocktail in a local restaurant. The reason right now we're in this series talking about anxiety and dealing with depression is because we've actually lost things that truly matter. Many of us in our church have lost jobs. We've lost hobbies. We've lost social interactions. We've lost our freedom to come and go as we please. And even for some of us in our church, we've lost loved ones. We've had people pass away from the, this uh, massive pandemic. And I don't really feel like I need to spend a lot of time establishing the argument that you feel anxious. I mean, you and I live this out all the time. We snap back at our families. We feel defensive at work about things that we wouldn't normally. I mean, our world as we know it has been put on edge. And the truth is, even more than losing your job or losing a relationship or even losing your freedom to come and go as you think you want to, uh, the root of our cultural anxiety and tension comes down to one thing, control. See, this global pandemic has sent us into a downward spiral of fear and blaming and self-preservation because it's taken control of the things in our life that we thought we were in charge of. See, you thought you were in charge of your career. You thought you knew where it was headed, but then coronavirus. You thought you were in charge of your emotions and then all of this goes down and you realize you're not in control of your emotions. You thought you had a good grasp of your faith and now you're just asking all sorts of questions and you don't even think you are where you thought you were. See, we feel destabilized as people, not just because we've lost control, but because the control that we thought we had was actually just an illusion all along. I mean, seriously, right now, if you were to audit your own anxiety, think about what gets you worked up, what keeps you up at night, where does your worry go when you spiral? Or where, do, where does your mind start to spin when you just can't slow down and you get anxious? See, there's a good chance that the amount of anxiety you feel is directly linked to the amount of control that you've lost. I want to say that again. There's a good chance that the amount of anxiety you feel in this moment is directly linked to the amount of control that you've lost. So my question is, what do we do about that? How do we get centered on God instead of spiraling out of control? What can we do practically to keep anxiety from becoming a real problem in our daily lives? Well, there's a really famous passage in the Bible that actually holds the key to combating anxiety. And the problem is, though, this passage is so famous, it's so familiar that whenever it gets brought up, we actually overlook it a lot of the times. But in this passage, as we're going to learn today, there is some great wisdom that can help us fight anxiety. The passage I'm talking about is actually in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 to 7. And it says this, Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Now, the famous part of this passage is the first half of verse 6, where it says, Don't worry about anything, but instead pray about everything. But what's crazy is we quote this a lot, but we actually do the opposite. Scripture says, don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. But what do we do? We worry about everything and we don't pray about anything. Paul says, tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. But what you and I do when we're stressed is we say, well, I need everything because God hasn't done anything. And I think it's important to acknowledge that we do feel this way sometimes, but we need to pause and we need to break down why this passage is so vital if we're going to win the battle against anxiety so that we don't stay in our feelings forever, 
but we can actually act on our faith. See, in Philippians, there's a promise here in this uh, passage. There's a promise from God that says we can experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. And that's incredible. That means that there's a divine peace that is available to all of us because God gives it to us. But the tension we have to face as humans is that many times we read about a promise of God in Scripture, but then we never experience it in our lives. But what I want to point out to you is that this, uh, what I want to point out to you about this passage is that there's a promise from God that's available to you, but it's predicated on your participation. That this promise that we could experience of God's peace is actually predicated on our participation. See, the opposite to anxiety is peace. It's being calm in the storm. It's the ability to be centered even when you have no control. And this passage clearly says there is a peace that can be experienced in this life that's beyond understanding. When other people see you being peaceful, they're going to think it doesn't make any sense. But there's a then statement in this passage. It says that God, when you tell him what you need, after you thank him for all he has done, then you will experience God's peace. And here's what this means. Experiencing a peace that surpasses all understanding begins by getting grateful. A way to combat anxiety right now in your life is to live in gratitude, to give thanks and spend time each day, not focusing on what's out of your control, but instead what you have to be thankful for. See, here's what God knows about you because he created you. You can't fight for control and be grateful at the same time. These things are actually incongruent. But most of us live in a way that actually squeezes out any room for gratitude because we're constantly seeking to have control. See, if you have control, when something good happens in your life, that's all about you. You earn it, you're a big deal, it validates you because you're in control. And then if you're in control and something goes south, that's your fault. You've got to fix it, you've got to solve it because you're in control. But here's the big problem. In a world where you're in control, there's no room to receive. And if your life is comprised solely of things that you earn and deserve, there's no room to be grateful because nothing is a gift. See, this passage shows us that if you want to have peace, You've got to get grateful. But this is really hard for us. If you were to categorize American culture, grateful is not a word that comes up a lot. I mean, Americans aren't typically known for being these peaceful, calm people, especially in our part of the country. But we're not a society that embraces gratefulness. We always want more. Here's something that's really interesting I read about recently. It was how in World War II, prior to World War II, advertising pretty much was always about the quality of the product. Like advertisers would give you messages about how their product was better than the other guys. And then you'd make your purchase. But the the ad was always about their product. But then after World War II, some hotshots came along and they realized that the key to increasing consumer spending wasn't convincing us that their product was better. It was convincing us that our lives were worse unless we got their product. So a shift occurred where we were no longer indoctrinated with messages about why their thing was superior but instead messages about why our lives were inferior unless we got what they were selling us. So the messaging shifted from being about the product and being about our own happiness. And this, punch a bunch of other factors, produced this massive economic boom following World War II and really just produced this DNA, this cultural norm that we all have where we need more. See, gratefulness, it's not in our bones as Americans. And that means this. It means gratitude is something that we have to work at. It doesn't come naturally for us. There's a famous monk actually named David Stendhal Ross. He travels the world speaking on gratitude. He's actually like BFS with the Dalai Lama, which sounds kind of cool. But he goes around doing TED Talks talking about gratitude. And here's what he points out. In order to be someone who is truly grateful, you need to have two things. One, you need to receive something that is of the utmost value to you. And then two, what you receive has to be a 100% gift. It can't be something you buy, can't be something you earn, can't be something you work toward. It's just a gift. Now, we've had moments in our life where you well up with gratitude because you get an amazing gift. But how do you live a life of gratitude? How does it become not just a moment in your year, but a practice that you can live on a consistent basis? See, I want to spend the rest of our time breaking down one action step. One thing that you could put into your emotional and spiritual tool belt that's going to help you be a less anxious person, but ultimately, it's going to help you become a more grateful person. But to set that up, let me tell you a story. Before everything got shut down, uh, one of my favorite things to do in my Sabbath, which is on my Saturday, was wake up really early with my two-year-old daughter, Evie, and we'd go on a daddy-daughter date to a local bagel shop. 
And I'm not gonna lie to you, it was a hassle getting her out of the house. Like, she loves wearing her PJs, so I have to fight to get her out of her PJs. Then I gotta get her some food, then I gotta get her in the car seat, make sure she has snacks, make sure she has her stuffed animal and all that stuff. But then we'd get to the bagel shop, and I'd park the car, and we'd hopped out of the vehicle, and we'd get to walk across the parking lot, walk across the street to go inside. And I absolutely love just that, like, that one, two minute time span where I'd get to sort of like show her off to people as we go into the restaurant. She's like my little person. She's walking, holding my hand. Everybody would greet her. She'd walk in like she owns the place. It was great. But every time we do that, no matter whether we were going into the shop or leaving the shop, because she's little and because she can walk and because we had to cross the street, we would do one thing over and over again. And if you have a little kid, you probably do it too with your child. But when we get to the street, we get to the curb, before we took a step, I'd say, Evie, we got to stop look both ways, and then go. We'd have to stop, look both ways, and then go. And here's what I want to suggest to, do, to you. This is how we fight anxiety. This phrase, to stop, look both ways, and go, this is how we get grateful. If you want to let go of worry and experience a peace that surpasses understanding, what I want to challenge you to do today is to stop, look both ways, and go. See, our verse today tells us that we need to pray about everything, that we need to tell God what we need, thank him for what he's done, and then we will experience God's peace. And I believe this phrase can help you live this out. See, the first part of this phrase is the word stop, and that's really important because scripture says that we need to pray. Now, sometimes I think that our activity fuels our anxiety. We tend to get more anxious the more we're trying to do everything. And then sometimes our anxiety spirals even when we're not doing something because we feel like we can't even accomplish everything we set out to do. So one of the absolute best things you can do when you catch yourself spiraling is to live this out. It's to stop. Paul's challenge to the Philippians is to pray about everything. And truth is, you can't do so if you're constantly active. If you're going to pray, you've got to pause. So that's the first part of this phrase. But then the next thing we see is to look both ways. And what this means is by looking back at the faithfulness of God in the past, you're going to let that past faithfulness inform how you step into what's coming up next. See, once you've paused and stopped, and you've actually just taken a break from moving, you can take a moment to look back at God's work in your life and see how he's pulled you out of even the darkest times and remember that he didn't abandon you then and he's not going to start now. Now, at this point, I'm sure some of you are wondering, like, John, where is this abandoned lot that you're standing in? Like, why are you here? What's going on? Well, truth is, this lot is actually where I go in my mind when I need to stop and look both ways, when I need to look back at God's faithfulness in my life because this lot represents a time in my life when God was moving even though I couldn't see it. Now, I've talked about my story before, but back in 2016, my wife and I had been trying to get pregnant for about 18 months. And we had some close calls. Sometimes we would get our hopes up, but after trying and trying for the whole time, nothing happened. So we went away for a treat with some friends at another church actually down in Virginia. And we spent a ton of time studying the Bible and worshiping God and just getting away from people. And during that retreat, actually, we both felt on separate occasions that God was calling us to leave our home, which was a rent-free living situation, and move to be closer to our Mosaic Arundel campus, which is down here in Odenton, just a couple miles from here. And it was scary because we felt like God was telling us to leave a rent-free situation to go spend a lot of money on rent. But not only that, we felt that God was calling us to step out in faith and rent a two-bedroom apartment, even though it was more expensive and even though we didn't need the space at the time. But we were called to do that as a way to show God that we believed that he might bless us with a baby. So within a month of getting back from this retreat, we moved out and we found an apartment. It's actually these buildings behind me right here. And for about five months, I would come out here in this lot in the morning and pray. I would come out here and and ask God to bless us with a child and to help us take care of leading Mosaic Arundel well. But every single month, we would take another pregnancy test and then another negative result. Month after month, another test, another negative, another test, another negative. But I kept coming out here. And then about five months later, sure enough, one morning, uh, Stephanie woke up, took a test, and we found out we were pregnant and we had our first little girl named Evie. And for the next 18 months, we raised her here. We took walks together in the parking lot. We'd cross the street and we'd stop and look both ways. And this abandoned lot that's actually pretty uh, desolate and ugly and kind of gross and not a great place to play with a toddler, this lot actually became an amazing and sweet and warm spiritual destination for me because it's where I'm reminded to look back at how God is faithful to me and, and to remember the incredible gift that he gave us through our daughter. 
See, we treasured the gift of pregnancy and it was something that we couldn't claim and we couldn't earn it. But by being faithful to God's leading and trusting in the faithfulness of our Lord, this lot and this apartment complex is actually really special to us. And truthfully, when I stop and I take a moment to look both ways, I come to this lot a lot in my own mind to remember how God was moving even when I couldn't see it. I'm reminded that especially when I can't see God moving, I don't have to wonder if he's for me or if he's working in my life because there's so many stories of how God's had my back and through uh, some of the darkest days of my life. And here's why I believe that this practice, to stop and look both ways, why it could be so powerful for you. When you look back, When you see how God moved in your past, it reframes our perspective to see that some of the life events we never appreciated in the first place are actually gifts from God that can fuel our gratitude. For you, maybe it's the birth of your child, or maybe it's when you became freed from some emotional baggage, or maybe it's just the fact that you're alive and breathing in this moment. But looking back can remind you, God is usually doing more behind your back than he is in front of your face. And that's something to be grateful for. And what happens then is that we start to reflect back on God's faithfulness in the past and then we start to look at our present circumstances with a shift in focus so that we can trust that God may be doing something even when we don't see it. So right now, I want to give us a moment to apply this, to stop and look both ways, to reflect on what God has done in the past and let his faithfulness inform how we step into what's ahead today, this week, this month, or even the next few hours. So right now, our band is going to play a song. And no matter where you are when you listen to this, whether you're in your car or you're at home or on a run, I want to encourage you to spend some time, just these few minutes, being moved by the lyrics and cataloging how God has got you to this point. Maybe get out a journal and start listing all that you feel like God has done. But in this moment, I want to encourage you, do the work of gratitude so that in a world obsessed with want and needing more, we get set apart and we fight against our anxiety with gratitude and experience a peace that goes beyond understanding.
this is Mario, and Mario's been coming to Mosaic for about five months. Yep. Uh, his fiance has been coming about a year, and he said, as we step into marriage, I want to step into my role of obedience to Christ and accept him as my savior and uh, become the leader of my home by dying to myself and giving up my life for Jesus so I can get grace. So Mario, I want you to repeat after me. I believe Jesus is the Christ. I believe Jesus is the Christ. Son of the living God. Son of the living God. My Lord and Savior. My Lord and Savior. I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Oh, good job, my man. Good job. This is Ashley, and when we were talking, I said, why are you here? And she said, it's time. And that's the best way I can put it. It's time to show everybody what's most important. And so I really respect that you're doing it even at a time like this to show what's most important to you. I want you to repeat after me. I believe Jesus is the Christ. I believe Jesus is the Christ. Son of the living God. Son of the living God. My Lord and Savior. My Lord and Savior. I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is Jacqueline, and uh, Jacqueline started coming to Mosaic two Christmases ago when somebody said, come and see. Started journeying here then. She would have called herself an agnostic as she began that journey. It was just new stuff to her. Then um, it was suggested that she join a group, and so she joined Katie's college age group because uh, she's a terp, and um, <laughs> that answered a lot of questions for her, and she's a very logical person, but she realized at some point, you know, I'm not going to have every question answered. and that's when faith comes in. And she said, honestly, my heart isn't 100% there because I have questions, but I know that if I take this action, my heart will follow. And um, just as a reminder to you of how excited people get when you accept Christ, she had somebody take an undercover video when she told her stepmom, so check this out. Are we doing anything on Thursday? School day. Can we be free at 6.30? We, you guys, are we, everyone, um, doing baptism Thursday? Shut up! All right, I want you to repeat after me, Jacqueline. Okay. I believe Jesus is the Christ. I believe Jesus is the Christ. Son of the living God. Son of the living God. My Lord and Savior. My Lord and Savior. Okay. We baptize you in the name of the Father, <laughs> Son, and Holy Spirit. Man, I love that song. It is so powerful. I hope you took time to stop and look both ways, to see that there's so much in your life to be grateful for, even in the midst of your pain, even in this pandemic. But here's what's really true. Gratitude keeps us grounded in faith when there's no guarantee things will get better. Gratitude keeps us from having situational faith so that we can trust in the goodness of God even when life is bad. 
And the truth is, me and Steph, we got blessed. Like, I know stories of people in our church who do all the right things, they take similar steps of faith, and yet still no pregnancy. Still no job. Still, they're dealing with the same old relational dysfunction. And I know some of you watching this right now are skeptical of this whole thing. You're wondering, John, how can I be grateful when I've lost my job? Why would I thank God for something when my parents are sick? How can I be grateful? I was supposed to have my wedding this month and that's not happening. And listen, I'm not trying to minimize your pain. I don't want you to gloss over it or to ignore it. But practicing gratitude reminds us that in all things, we have hope. Because the ultimate truth we look back on when we look back and look both ways, the thing we see is the cross of Jesus Christ. See, the ultimate thing to be grateful for is the cross because it's the ultimate gift and you can't earn it. It's of the utmost value. It's eternal life, complete forgiveness, undeserved grace, and salvation through relationship with God. And it's this gift that you can't earn. You don't deserve it, but God gave himself freely because he loves you that much, because you have inherent worth to him. See, what the cross means is that God sent his son to earth for the sole purpose of redeeming us for fixing our brokenness once and for all and bridging the gap between our sin and his perfection so that in Jesus, even though he lived a perfect life and didn't deserve death, through his death and resurrection on the cross, we can be forgiven, redeemed, and restored and brought into a relationship with our Heavenly Father. See, because of the cross, our gratitude tank is never empty because through faith in Jesus, we receive the ultimate gift of ultimate value, salvation and forgiveness and hope for all. So the last thing we got to do, if we're going to live out this practice, to stop and look both ways, the last thing we got to do is go. And some of you are here and you've looked back at what God has done. You've been inspired by how he's had your back this whole time. And right now you have the courage and the strength to take a step and to go. And for some of you, that could mean joining one of our mosaic groups to talk about your faith and connect with real people and experience God on a more relational level. Some of you, that step to go means writing a check to someone and blessing them because you're overwhelmed with how God has taken care of you in the midst of this pandemic. And then some of you, that go word just means to give your life to Christ, to repent of your sin and to get baptized. And if that's you right now, we want you to get at your phone right now as you're listening and to text 443-445-0071. The number's on your screen. We want you to text that number and include your name and we'll follow up with you about what does it mean to follow Jesus. But my desire for us as a church is that we'd be people who fight anxiety with gratitude. And I think a great way to remember to do that is to stop, look both ways, and then go. Truthfully, my, my prayer for all of us is summed up really well in a verse that I've come to love recently in Colossians 3.15. And here's what it says. It says, Let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. And not surprisingly, look at this last part. And it says, always be thankful. Let's be people who catch ourselves when we spiral, to stop, look both ways, and then go. And we'll combat anxiety with gratitude, with thankfulness in our hearts for the gifts that God has given us, even in the midst of this crazy pandemic. Let's pray. God, I know uh, it's really even difficult to engage in this conversation if someone is spiraling and they just feel like there's all these external stressors that have sent them into chaos. So God, I, um, I ask that even now, as we're praying together, that you would um, calm the storm in our minds and let us have some clarity where we could think about the good things you have done for us, the good things in our life that are true and admirable and pure, that we can thank you for. And I pray even now as we wrap up that uh, you would remind us tomorrow and the day after to stop, look both ways, get centered on the good things you've given us, and then take steps of faith. We love you, Jesus, and we know we come to you because of what you did for us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for joining us. If you're joining us for the first time, we would love for you to let us know so we could say, hey, text the number below so that we can reach out. Let's spend this week being grateful for what we've been overlooking. We love you. We cannot wait to see you next time, Mosaic.